Chronicle opens by telling us Azeroth is but one small world in a vast universe. This set the scene for Legion, but it was misleading, because time and time again we have seen how important Azeroth is. Every force in the universe seems bent on controlling her. All roads lead to her. Azeroth is now both a setting and a character, and if any one force can control or consume her soul, they will conquer the known universe. They will win. Likewise, if Azeroth is allowed to awaken, it means infinite potential for us, her natives. Knowledge, then, of her immense power has shaped the direction of the cosmos for hundreds of thousands of years in the WoW universe, likely far more, as we are working on a cosmic timescale. So today, you are going to learn all about Azeroth, starting from her birth. And by the time this video is done, you will understand who will come to be the single most important character in the Warcraft universe, the one whose fate the entire universe rests upon. In this video, sponsored by Skillshare, where the first thousand of you to click my link will get a free trial that is twice as long, and it's only 10 bucks a month for premium after that. And you'll get access to thousands of classes, but today we are kicking off, you know, it's, it's the new year, it's a new January, and I'm going to recommend Ali Abdal's Productivity Masterclass. Over on YouTube, now he's at a million, and many of those subs he gained while he was also a junior doctor. So yeah, he has a deep understanding of how to get things done, and his masterclass is the one to learn from. It is awesome. I would say though, this is not about hustle culture, no, or grind reels. This is about getting the things you need to get done, done, so that you can then live the rest of your life and experience more freedom in whatever way you want. And I think that what Ali has will help you do that greatly, and you can get his class, as I have, along with thousands more, for free with my trial. Just click that link down below, and the trial you get there is double the regular length. So, a big thank you to returning sponsor Skillshare, and with that, let's dive into the history of Azeroth. Azeroth formed in the wake of a clash between light and void into a cosmos split between the six fundamental forces. And in this cosmic drama, Azeroth is a titan. Titans are godlike beings who prize order and harmony above all else. Arcane is the realm of magic, and they use it to place their vision of order over reality. Thus far, each titan has an alignment, such as Aenar to life, Amunthul to time, and Golganath to the skies and oceans, but we've never known Azeroth's aspect. Many would say that is because she is a very special character indeed. An early sign of this world soul's power was in fact the near total consumption of the element of spirit. You see, in Warcraft, every planet Titan or not, has elements. And the fifth element, spirit, is the one that brings balance to the others. And in those very early stages of her life, as she grew, Azeroth consumed all of that fifth element. And without the element of spirit to balance the other four, the elemental lords of fire, earth, air, and water were set into a cycle of conflict. A cycle that would eventually be interrupted. Of all forces, the Void Lords were the first to make their move. Trapped in a realm outside of reality, they instead had to work through the old gods, nightmarish and corrupted beings that were hurled across the universe, likely in their millions, so that they could land on titan worlds and consume their souls. And across the universe, countless worlds fell to these old gods. Five of those old gods found Azeroth, and plummeting down from the skies, embedded themselves in the planet's crust. Creatures slithered out of their oozing bodies and raised Cyclopean structures around their masters, creating the Black Empire. This Black Empire spread across Azeroth in a purple, undulating mass, part temple, part infection. 
But the real damage was done by the old gods themselves. For while their empire expanded across the planet's surface, they slowly burrowed down into the core, reaching their corrupting tendrils towards the sleeping world soul. And if they ever reached that world soul, they would twist Azeroth into a corrupted, warped titan, one that would then be so powerful it could consume the whole cosmos in the name of Void. By this stage, the other titans had awakened and they had formed the Pantheon. Their champion, Sargaris, who usually spent his time fighting the demons of disorder, had discovered the Void Lord's plan from a Nathrezim cultist. Shocked by this, Sargaris eventually found one of these old god corrupted worlds, one that mustn't have looked too far from how Azeroth would have looked during the Black Empire. And knowing what was at stake, Sargaris destroyed it. The Pantheon, aghast at his actions, would never see the logic in what he did, even though Sargaris may have in that moment actually saved the entire universe. And because of this, Sargaris left. Agrimar, then, once Sargaris' mentor, found himself the new champion of the Pantheon. And as he peered through the cosmos, he sensed something. He sensed the dreams of an extremely powerful Titan world soul. Eventually, finding it covered in Old God, he returned to the Pantheon, convincing them that this world soul had immense potential if it was saved. Hearing his story, the rest of the Titans agreed. And so it was, they traveled and they got ready for war. Now, while an old god is a tremendous threat, ultimately, they're nothing to a planet-sized Titan. So arriving at Azeroth, reaching down from the skies, Amunthul, the High Father of the Titans, ripped the old god Yisharj from Azeroth's crust. And that was it gone, but the roots were so deep that this tore a great wound in the planet. And fearing further damage to the world soul, the Titans instead relied on their forged creations to defeat this black empire of the five Azerothian old gods, and then to lock them deep beneath the planet's surface. For they found that those old gods were so intertwined with the planet that just if they were ripped out, that Azeroth would be killed, and perhaps the Titan's last hope would be gone. With this, Azeroth had been saved from its immediate threat. The Titans, content with their victory, gifted their keepers, the most powerful of their forged creations, the Pillars of Creation. These were powerful artifacts to help them shape the world. And with that, the Titans left for the stars. The wound left by Yashars, though, was bleeding pure energy. And that does tell us that a Titan bleeds, it can die, but also that their blood, or blood as we would call it, is of immense power. This wound was then reshaped into the Well of Eternity, a placid sea at the heart of a single supercontinent. The Tidestone of Golgonath, one of those pillars of creation, shaped the ocean floors, whilst the Hammer of Kazgaroth was used to shape the mountains and cut arcane ley lines into the planet. And this perhaps tells us that the condition of a world soul surface is vital to its survival, likely even to its developing psychology. I mean, think about how physically and mentally twisted Argus was when we eventually found him. It also does show us the importance of ley lines and how they represent the pure manifestation of Azeroth's energy, arcane. As for the other pillars of creation, we can speculate that the Eye of Amunthul had to do with well, time somehow, that the Aegis of Agrimar was a weapon meant for Odin, the leader of the Keepers, and that the Tears of Elune were used by Freya, the Keeper of Life. And as we'll see, the Keepers needed a lot more than just a handful of trinkets. The Titan Keepers constructed two important facilities. First, the Forge of Will. 
This would help shape the world soul's developing consciousness. Second, they created the Forge of Origination to regulate the internal rhythms of the planet itself. This shows us the duality of a titan, that both the world soul needs to be nurtured as well as the planet, crust, mantle, and everything else. But there then seems to be a third fundamental thing, and that is life. And that's why the forges had a second purpose. The forges could draw energy from the world soul to create sentient life. This was eventually used to create those titan-forged armies. The Forge of Origination's second purpose, then, also involved life, and that was to wipe out all life on the planet. You see, life seems to be quite important for developing a world soul, and certainly if you create life and house it on a world, and that world is under threat, then that life will try to defend its home, and that is a useful thing. But, but, that life... What if it was corrupted by void? Then that could lead to corruption of the world soul. As such, fail-safes were created. The forge, when triggered, could restart the evolutionary protocols of the planet. It could reoriginate Azeroth. Reoriginate essentially means destroy all life and start again from scratch. And this tells us that the Titans had an incredibly long view of Azeroth's development, that it could perhaps even take several evolutionary cycles for a Titan to fully wake up. And who knows, as beings in Azeroth, we would have just about no idea if indeed there have been multiple reoriginations before us. I mean, if they built the system well enough, we would probably have no way of knowing. Having created the forges, the keepers then set about creating organic life. The Emerald Dream was used as a perfect ecological mirror for Azeroth. Now the thing with the dream is, it's debatable who actually made it. If it's purely a creation of the Titans for a purpose, or if it is perhaps a realm of the lifelands, in the same way the death has its shadowlands, and I would say that does seem more likely at this stage. What's important to understand here is just how closely linked the dream is to Azeroth, as it does represent, in the Titan's eyes, the blueprint of a perfect world. Led by Freya, the Keeper of Life, the living laboratories of Ungoro and Sholazar Basin were then used to develop and to refine that life. And in this process, the strongest of the creatures that came from these ancient forests were uplifted by Freya, who bound their spirits to the Emerald Dream, and in doing so, as we see in the Shadowlands expansion, to Ardenweald, the death mirror of the Emerald Dream. All of this, down to the selection of Ungoro and Sholazar, is thanks to Azeroth herself. For it was those regions of the planet that had access to the Well of Eternity's waters. And that means that it was Azeroth's energy that directly nurtured the life upon her surface. Life had been created. Vast Titan-forged armies stood ready to build and defend the planet. Installations across it bolstered Azeroth's help. Sometime later, a new group would arise to defend the planet as well, the Dragonflights. Impressed by their capabilities and strength of character displayed in the fight against the proto-dragon Galakrond, the Titans ended up deciding to uplift the best of the dragons. And so, the red Alexstrasza and green Ysera were charged with life and the Emerald Dream, while the bronze Norsduma was charged with time, the black Naltharian was charged with earth, and the blue Malagos with magic. And together with the Titan Keepers and their vast array of installations, Azeroth should finally be safe, right? Sargaris knew what would happen if a titan soul fell to the void. It's why he destroyed that first planet. He also knew he'd never be able to convince his kin that all life, that all creation should be scoured in order to prevent that fall. Thinking that he alone could then save creation in a way, Sargaris resolved himself to take on that task, to scour the universe clean of life. 
To do this, he would need an army, and Sargaris knew exactly where to get it. His millennia spent fighting demons had filled the prison of Mardum. Problem solved. Sargaris cracked open Mardum and subjugated the legions of demons that he had originally imprisoned to serve as the foot soldiers of his new army. And with this, Sargaris's fall to disorder was complete and he became the Dark Titan. The Nathrazi, a race of vampiric creatures, also commonly referred to as the Dreadlords, joined him. Now bear in mind what you heard earlier, that it was a Nathrazim who, in the first place, sowed the seeds of Sargaris's fall by telling him about the Void's plan. Far from Azeroth, Sargaris found the Titans over the world of Nihilim. Amunthul pleaded with his fallen brother. He told him of the world soul of Azeroth and how Azeroth had the potential to defeat the Void, to defeat the problem Sargaris was worried about. And while Sargaris did listen, he was unmoved. He was full of fell demonic energy and he killed Amunthul. He destroyed the rest of the Titan Pantheon and he began searching for Azeroth, this new and much lauded world soul. Because as much as Amunthul thought that it could be the key to their success, that its great power could mean victory, Sargaris knew that if its great power fell, it would be certain defeat. Unbeknownst to Sargaris though, the Titan Norganon had managed to save a portion of each Titan's essence. They floated through the cosmos, and they ended up going back to Azeroth, ideally to be hidden within their Titan Keepers. And while this plan would go somewhat awry in the future, that the Titans returned to their Keepers in Azeroth does tell us a lot, as does Amunthul's belief that an awakened Azeroth would be enough to defeat the Void Lords. The Titans had made sure to use powerful magics to keep Azeroth hidden. And for a long time, she was hidden, she was safe. It was not until the races of Azeroth, after millennia and millennia, developed and began experimenting with arcane magic that everything started to go wrong. The Night Elves were originally a group of trolls, a group that had settled around the Well of Eternity's shores. And they used its water for everything. And as they did that, they slowly became uplifted by its, Azeroth's, power, becoming the Kaldori that we know today. Now they learned how to focus the arcane energy and they used it to build an empire of immense strength. This use though became increasingly reckless and it reverberated into the cosmos, catching the attention of Sargaris and his burning legion. Sargaris contacted the highborn courts of the Keldori, their most upper crust, their most powerful magic users, and he convinced them to summon him to Azeroth using the Well of Eternity. And this is when the War of the Ancients was fought to stop the highborn led by their Queen Ashara. The details are not important to today's video, but the conclusion of this war is. As Sargaris began to manifest, the Well of Eternity was overloaded by the defenders and it was destroyed. This was calamitous. It tore the supercontinent apart and it did unknowable harm to the world's soul. So yes, Sargaris and his legion were temporarily defeated, but it was catastrophic for the races of Azeroth who in many ways had their planet shattered. In the aftermath of the war, Night Elf society was not pleased with the Highborn. So the remaining Highborn were exiled and they sailed east across this new ocean. Their king, Kelthas's grandfather, had with him a vial of water from the Well of Eternity. And when they eventually settled in Quelthalas, the Highborn blessed a new font with the vial creating the Sunwell. Now this portion of Azeroth's power via the well was enough to sustain the Highborn society and slowly transform them into the smaller and more fair-skinned High Elves that we see today. 
And this is another example of Azeroth's raw power changing the physical nature of life. From Troll to Night Elf, and then from Night Elf to High Elf. The High Elves then taught humanity magic, because by this stage, many, many, many years have passed. I've covered over 150,000 years in this video. Many, many more, very likely. And the humans are about. Now, we humans were not delicate with our use of Titan power, of this magic, but we were able to draw upon vast amounts of it. Humanity's casters quickly realized that the cosmos was in fact filled with danger. And so, the Council of Tirasfall was formed. And it was formed from the most powerful practitioners to defend Azeroth from the Legion, as well as other threats. Being able to tap into the World Soul's arcane is in a way what made them so powerful, not that they necessarily knew the true nature of Azeroth at that time. There were other races, of course, such as the Tauren, who knew the world soul of Azeroth as the Earth Mother, as a part of their religion. And we have to wonder how the Tauren spoke to Azeroth and how that relationship has developed. Bane, after, of course, knowing that Azeroth was a titan with a world soul, but Bane seemed to know she was dying during the Fourth War, and in Warcraft 3, we actually saw the Earth Mother directly save Karn and Thrall. So that certainly is an interesting thing. Then, of course, there are the dwarves who, like the humans, were descended from the Titans, descended from the creations of the Titans, who, of course, received their spark from Azeroth. Of course, the change from metal and stone construct to fleshy being was because of the curse of flesh that did come from the old gods, but that is largely outside of the scope of today's video. The point is, though, that these races were all influenced by Azeroth, and they were all coming closer to discovering her true secrets. The first Legion invasion failed to destroy Azeroth, but Sargeras' crusade would not be denied. There is even evidence that Sargaris's ambitions had changed somewhat. The Scepter of Sargaris tells us in its lore document that after the War of the Ancients, the Dark Titan had a vision. He was drawn to the core of Azeroth, and there he saw a slumbering world soul. And in that moment, the world soul opened one eye and glazed at the Dark Titan. He was enraptured. After this, he had a stylized Eye of Azeroth placed at the head of his scepter, crowned by two Nathrezim wings. For Sargaris, this potentially represented a, a new perfect vision of Azeroth. It was his very, very direct glimpse and interaction with her. The question is, did he want to destroy Azeroth, or did he want to claim Azeroth's power now that he had actually had an interaction with her? Of course, as I speak to you now, in the era of the Shadowlands, you can see these wings as taking on new significance. Documents found in Revendreth have essentially confirmed that the Nath regime were never fully committed to Sargaris's cause. In fact, they were agents of Sire Denathrius, who was of course working for the Jailer, who ultimately is an individual who wants to consume Azeroth's soul. So indeed, we see crowning the scepter, Sargaris' ultimate prize. But then perhaps we see the blinkers on, the blinders on, that those Nathazim wings are in fact them blinding Sargaris' ambition. Indeed, perhaps wanting to ultimately claim and protect Azeroth for the Nathazim's true master to make his move. The Nathrezim deceptions would continue. They presented a plan to the lords of the Burning Legion. To use the fallout of their dealings on a world known as Draenor, to send an agent, the Lich King, to Azeroth, and to have him spread a plague of undeath. This was all to pave the way for a full Legion invasion. But of course, we now know that secretly, the Lich King was working for his true master, the Jailer. The true goal here was to raise and unite Azeroth in undeath. To use that entirely unified in death planet to fight off any cosmic invaders so that it would be there on a platter 
for the jailer to claim once he finally would escape from the Maw. Of Azeroth's races, the dwarves would discover the truth first. In a way, our own understanding as players has developed alongside that of the dwarves. It began with the ruins in Loch Modan. Then, a chance rock slide revealed an entrance to the titan city of Ulderman. This gave us a tantalizing glimpse of the gods. But they were mere minor titan facilities. It wasn't until the dwarves found Ulduard that we appreciated the scope of titan influence. We discovered the Forge of Will built into the largest mountain on the planet. Another discovery, the Path of the Titans, trailed off into the ocean, promising yet more to be discovered. Shortly after discovering these Titan facilities and thwarting the Lich King, natural disasters began to occur all over the planet. A cataclysm was approaching. The Dwarven homelands were at great risk from earthquakes, and there was a sense that the planet itself was in trouble. Seeing this, Magni Bronzebeard, King of the Dwarves, attempted an ancient ritual that would allow him to speak to the planet itself. This ritual seemed like a failure at the time. Magni was turned to diamond and was unable to communicate, so he was assumed dead. Four years later, though, Magni would reawaken, claiming that he was of the Earth and spoke for the planet. Azeroth was, at this stage, transforming from a space rock to something that had personality and that wanted to speak with us. While King Magni underwent that ritual to save them from the Cataclysm, it of course meant that he was out of action for four years as a diamond. Well, in those four years, a lot happened. In their thousands of years of imprisonment, the old gods had worn at their chains. Slowly, very slowly, they began corrupting the races of Azeroth. Naltharion, the Earth Warder, the black dragon from earlier, was traveling the depths of the planet when he heard the whispers of Nazoth. And slowly, he was corrupted. He took the name Deathwing and promised a cataclysm that would ultimately destroy the planet. This was part of a prophecy named the Hour of Twilight, the End Time, when Azeroth would in fact become a warped, void titan. Deathwing and his black dragon flight, along with cultist allies, would wage many wars and have many fights, but were defeated every time. Nizoth, seeing this, kept on giving him more and more of his power until Deathwing went completely insane. Then, Deathwing began the cataclysm. He exploded forth from Deep Home, deep underneath the earth, and he caused catastrophic damage to the fabric of the world. This wounded the world's soul, and if it were not for Thrall, and of course us, Deathwing would have committed a, well, second and final cataclysm. We aren't totally satisfied that the Hour of Twilight prophecy is over, though, for the Void Lords are still out there, and they still do want a warped titan. It would take years for both the planet and the soul to heal from this cataclysm, and in that time we ventured to Pandaria, we defeated there the last vestiges of the destroyed old god Yesharj. We then went to alternate Tranor, where we found the orc warlock Gul'dan, still dedicated to his legion masters. One way or another, these would lead to Azeroth's near-fatal wounding at the hands of Sargaris. Sargaris's first invasion, the War of the Ancients, failed. And before his second invasion, Warcraft III, which also failed, he ended up possessing a avatar, an avatar of himself. This avatar was defeated by a member of the Council of Terrasfall called Aegwyn, and that resting place was known as the Tomb of Sargaris. And this is where it re-enters the story with the third invasion of the Burning Legion, where Gul'dan traveled from Draenor to the Tomb of Sargaris, and there he opened a gateway. 
So Garrus had been waiting. His endless legions and thousands of ships were ready to claim Azeroth. Well, half of an expansion of fighting later and a desperate, desperate expedition to Argus saw the end of Argus's world soul. And as that conflict reached its climax, Sargaris loomed over Azeroth, about to claim his prize, when the other titans, who we had rescued, imprisoned him in the seat of the Pantheon. Before Sargaris could be taken, though, and knowing that he had been defeated, that actually Azeroth would not be his, Sargaris stabbed Azeroth in what seemed to be a strike driving for the heart of her world soul. He failed, and his sword was left embedded in the zone of Silithus. Sargaris was now imprisoned by the Titan Pantheon, but still, this was the closest Azeroth had ever came to dying, and she was direly wounded. Magni brought his explorer brother Bran Bronzebeard and the mage Khadgar to Ulduar and revealed the truth to them. This was the first time that anyone on the planet other than Magni knew that in fact Azeroth was a titan world soul, and this is where we learned that Magni was alive and was her speaker. Magni was instrumental in finding the pillars of creation and defeating the Legion, but after Sargaris wounded Azeroth, his position as speaker became even more critical. Azeroth was going into systemic shutdown. It was really bad. The world soul was hemorrhaging what we now call Azerite and was on the brink of death. Magni found the Chamber of the Heart just in time and used the heart of Azeroth to stabilize the world soul. He then traveled the world, healing her many wounds, but the situation just got worse. The final old god, Nizoth, was the weakest, but he was the smartest, the most scheming. And using the chaos caused by the Legion invasion and the fight between the world's factions that ensued, he attempted to then consume the world's soul. He began manifesting the nightmare realm of the Black Empire onto Azeroth once again, and if he succeeded, Azeroth would become a warped titan. Magni and the champion of Azeroth were in fact able to use the heart as a focusing lens for the forges that we mentioned earlier, and harnessing the pure power of the world soul, Nizoth and his vision for Azeroth were destroyed. The brave heroes who accomplished this, who fought and bled and died for this, returned to Magni Bronzebeard and they received 93 gold for their trouble. The battle for Azeroth was over and she had been saved. Of course, we all know that a bit of Azeroth's story continues in the Shadowlands expansion, but more because we know she is part of the Jailer's plan. And indeed, if we had done a full history of Azeroth style video like this one a year or two ago, it would have been completely wrong because of the Nathrezim revelation and the Lich King revelation that goes along with it. So with all of this said, what of Azeroth? What is Azeroth? Well, this video all goes a long way to answering the question of who she is. Azeroth is the most powerful Titan soul. She won't always be something to defend, though, because one day she is going to wake up. And perhaps then we will find out what her aspect is. You know, Argus' is death, Aenar is life, Amenthal is time, and we have no idea what Azeroth is. That certainly is a little bit interesting and speculative. And we really don't know what to expect, what will happen when she does wake up how the long sleep and her many wounds will have affected her. But it will happen, for waking up is something the Titan world souls do. And people will, I think, maybe wonder, what will she think of us? What will she do with us? What will happen to us if we're on the planet? And suddenly the planet wakes up, turns into this humongous being, something the scale of which we really got a glimpse at whenever Sargaris appeared to stab her. He was so massive, that's the size of a titan. I imagine that Azeroth would see us as her children. In a way, we are, right? 
While she certainly did shape part of the destiny of the orcs and the Draenei, who are of course alien species, she is quite literally the essence of life on Azeroth, for it was the waters of the Well of Eternity that nourished Frey's living laboratories all of those millennia ago. And yes, those wild gods that wandered forth and were uplifted and bound to the Emerald Dream, there is of course a bit of Azeroth in them because of that. So she'll look upon us as children. Her reawakening will also then represent a massive shift in the power dynamic of this fictional universe. If Azeroth wakes up, we likely won't have to defend her all the time, right? What would an expansion look like where we are going out into the cosmos to make it a better place, when Azeroth is there, not speaking to us through Magni? It would be pretty different having a world where it's not all a new problem coming to us every expansion. Recently on the channel, we talked about the brokers and how they have opened up the concept of traveling the cosmos. Well, when Azeroth wakes up, which I think will happen, be it in 5, 10, or 15 years in real life, we'll not have to worry about uh, what we're going to find out there as much because we'll be backed up by one of the most powerful entities in the setting. And indeed, the setting. Because if Blizzard really wants to change the setting of Warcraft, maybe even draw it to a close, or usher in a totally fresh new chapter, then the awakening of Azeroth would be the momentous event they would need. Though, much like how Age of Sigmar reimagined Warhammer, to the dismay of many longtime fans, Blizzard would risk doing the same. So there you go. I really hope you enjoyed this video. This was a massive effort from the whole team. Things like this, they're a lot more chunky. And really, these are possible, not because of the regular YouTube stuff, it's possible because of sponsors like Skillshare. And what's great is the sponsors that we get are uh, ones that, you know, I've used their stuff. Skillshare is awesome. Ali Abdal's Productivity Masterclass has helped me out of some rough spots. It's real, real solid stuff. So if you'd like to support the people who make content like this, go check out that free trial. You've got nothing to lose. And you know what? Quite a lot to gain because it's a really, really good class. Okay, that is it for me. I'm going to leave you. What do you think Azeroth's unique aspect is? Or do you think she is some sort of like Omni Titan with like all of the different powers? I'd love to know what your theories are for the future of Azeroth or perhaps even what will happen when she wakes up. Because if the planet we're standing on wakes up, surely that's a bit rough for us. So let me know. Check out Skillshare down below. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.